Why do people listen to music that makes them feel sad? This is one of the questions I answered in an interview with the Montreal-based musician Naz Kepchkarian for his project, The Crescent. We spoke about the role of emotion in music, how technology has changed composition forever, why I started my YouTube channel, and how musicians can harness the power of social media. I thought it was a good discussion, so with Naz's permission, I'm posting this compilation of the best moments from our discussion. If you want to watch the whole video, you can click on the link in the video description. As ever, don't forget to hit subscribe and like so you will never miss another analysis or interview video. Thanks for watching. If something makes you feel sad, you'll usually stop doing that thing that made you feel sad. Uh, and one thing he pointed out was that music does evoke the same emotion and we actually seek it out actively. I was curious to have your take on it as a composer. Why would you want to even evoke that in, a, in the listener? Well, it's, it's sadness, but it's like it's sadness in a zoo, right? It's sadness that you can go and visit and it's behind a cage and it's not going to kill you. And it's not, it's not associated with an actual tragic event. It's metaphoric, right? And so I think there's a tremendous utility in being able to voluntarily experience different emotional states through artworks. One of the things that is really cool about classical symphonies, for example, is that they attempt to present you with a picture of the whole human being uh, with the range of passions that a human being can experience. And that's something that I think is really quite attractive about classical music is this attempt to create an entire kind of cosmology of, of inner space, so to speak, of, of the range of human experiences. The next interesting point was the way that music is consumed. The, the fact that it's digitized that we're in the digital age and everyone can just add a click, listen to whatever they want from wherever they want, essentially. Do you think that impacts anything at all? Or what, what do you think is happening there? It's hard to see how it wouldn't affect things in a very profound way. One of the big things that Industrial Revolution changed was that you no longer had to be able to play an instrument in order to have music in your house. That had profound and far-reaching consequences for music. It changed absolutely everything. If you were in a reasonably well-off middle-class family, then the odds were that you, as part of your education, you would learn to play an instrument. After the Industrial Revolution, it became possible for all kinds of people in a broad range of social situations to purchase a phonograph or whatever and, and buy uh, recordings and play those at home. Or, you know, in some cases, you could buy a player piano or something like that and play roles in your house. Right. So you didn't actually need to know how to play the piano. You could buy a machine that would do that for you. Yeah. So that had profound uh, implications. It meant that the audience for music was vastly wider than it had been up to that point. Suddenly you had millions of people interested in music rather than say a few thousand or whatever. I, obviously um, these, are, yeah. these numbers are heuristics, but, of course. but it, it meant that the, the audience could be far, far broader than it had been up to that point. It also meant that you could have a much broader range of musical styles on offer to the public you start to see the emergence of large numbers of different styles, really highly individualistic styles coming out also with composers developing really quite personal and idiosyncratic languages, which hadn't really been the case to nearly the same extent up to that point. And this really starts to take off around the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, when suddenly there's this explosion of all of these different contrasting approaches to composition, some of which are really uh, idiosyncratic, personal, and experimental in nature. But you can do that because there's a huge audience suddenly. It's much easier to disseminate music. It's much easier to, uh, to write a piece, have it recorded. It doesn't need to be performed a hundred times. You can just perform it once and record it, and then thousands of people can hear it. And what we're seeing now, I don't think it's a, uh, a paradigm shift exactly because the, I, the principle is the same. The, the idea is still that you can record a piece of music and disseminate it electronically uh, to a wider number of people than would be the case otherwise. But we're seeing a dramatic acceleration in the ease with which that can be done. And also just the number of people that can access it. The other thing that is a profound consequence is the fact that it's become quite a lot harder to monetize musical production. People are accustomed to being able to pay $10 a month for a Spotify subscription and get virtually anything that's ever been recorded available to them for free whenever they want. So how are you supposed to make money off recordings then? It's a problem that needs to be solved because if there's no financial incentive for record companies to invest in artists, 
and to spend money producing recordings, then how is that going to continue to happen? If a new piano piece of mine is premiered somewhere, there might be 200 people in the audience. If I put it on YouTube or if somebody else puts it on YouTube, it'll get tens of thousands of views. That wouldn't have been possible 50 years ago. Right. That certainly changes things, but it also means that the vast majority of people, like 1% or less, are going to be hearing it live compared to the number of people that are going to hear it on the internet. I don't know if that makes people value the live experience more. People are just accustomed to the way that recorded music sounds. People who maybe aren't used to attending concerts, sometimes when they go to hear an orchestra for the first time, they're actually disappointed because it's, it doesn't have that immediacy and that vividness and the, you know, it's not, the sound isn't compressed and it's not mixed and so on. And it's not in your, you know, in your headphones and it's not right, you know, coming from inside your skull. And so it sounds a little bit more maybe distant than they might be expecting. It's not as overwhelmingly physical as maybe the experience you might be able to have with the surround sound system in your home. So that's kind of weird. Where, where you kind of influence, uh, you influence the piece, but then it sort of influences you back and then it keeps bouncing back and forth. Would you say there's an element of that? Well, music doesn't just spring forth from my inner being. I mean, mm -hmm. music is a collective possession that belongs to everybody. It's a world that millions of people have added to over the centuries. I didn't invent the violin. I didn't right. invent the format of the chamber concerto. I didn't invent the 12 note chromatic scale. I didn't invent any of the instruments that I'm writing for. I didn't invent the, the system of notation. I didn't invent the tuning system. I didn't invent any of these things. So, so, and I didn't invent the history of music either and, <laughs> and all of the associations that, that violin concertos can have. And just even just the sound of a violin and the technical possibilities of a violin, all of those things are like a common property that I'm working with as I make my piece. So there's obviously a certain amount of it that comes from me, from my experiences and from my particular abilities and inabilities and limitations. But then there's also the dialogue between myself and my particular personal misreading of, of music history and my idiosyncratic uh, tendency of finding this interesting rather than this. Right. It's, it is a symbiotic process, I would say. You know, it's a dialogue between, uh, between what's already been done and then you know, the, the particular things that I can bring to that situation. Why? And I've heard you speak about this briefly, like, for example, the, the sort of reticence that some composers may have about coming onto YouTube. What do you think was the thing that convinced you to start? What made you different on that? The reticence is easy to understand because social media is simultaneously a great gift and a very dangerous type of poison. So, and we don't know which it is, really, it can, because it can be both of those things. So there are lots of people that have their lives destroyed on social media. But at the same time, it does amazing things like, you know, it, it, it creates opportunities for free public education on practically any topic you can imagine. And it puts people in contact with each other in a way that can be very productive. If you go into social media and you start to get a bit of a presence, then you're immediately exposed. Uh, people know what you think and they can criticize it. And they can criticize it on a grand scale. If I put up a video and it gets 200,000 views, I can be ridiculed, I can be criticized, I can be exposed for being the fraud that I am and so on. Um, it's very, very easy for that to happen. And it doesn't take much also for that sort of reaction to happen. Social media, whether you like it or not, is determining the way the world goes on every level. So I think you can't really ignore it. Uh, you can have it affect you and not be aware of that and not be aware of how it's affecting you. Or you can try to become aware of how it works and try to steer it in a good direction. I don't think really it matters anymore what particular genre you're working in or what, uh, what style you're working in. I don't think that is at all relevant anymore because it's just present for everything now. There isn't a single corner of the music world that hasn't been profoundly transformed by social media. But I don't think that you can you know, sit in a corner somewhere and not be affected by it because the transformation is, too, is far too profound. There's just so much to be done now. There, there are so many resources and there's so much technology available to everybody now. The ways that people can connect are, are so vastly more sophisticated than anything that we could have imagined uh, two decades ago. You're seeing a lot of composers emerge that are probably not going to have a huge audience but they might have a micro audience that is really devoted to that particular type of music. 
I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing necessarily in, in and of itself, but it does mean that I'm continually surprised and stimulated by the music that young people are sending me all the time. And that's really exciting. Now, what is your primary focus? Would it be teaching or still composition? Composition. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's why I do everything I do. Okay. The, the creative impulse is, is number one. I'm trying to, I'm trying to create things. I'm trying to invent new worlds. And everything that I do ties into that. So at, in, a, in a given day, I, I teach. I also have a teaching position in Germany, in Freiburg. I, um, I work on my podcasts and my YouTube channel, of course. I'm involved in, in putting together festivals and I do recording projects. I do CDs. I, do, um, I, do, I work with a publisher very closely. Uh, I write books. I do all of these different things. They all feed into the composition aspect. So... Some of those things I do in order to be able to have, well, to be able to make a living, obviously, but also to have the necessary scaffolding in place so that I can sit down in a room by myself and write and not have anybody disturb me. You need, you need a structure in place in order to be able to do that. So some of those activities, uh, that's what their purpose is. 